everybody. Um, my name is Patrick Sweeney. I'll be I'll be moderating this panel. Uh, the panel name is a little bit unwieldy, but what to look for and how to work effectively with your external advocates and professionals. So uh, increasingly, obviously, as independent games and, and casual games uh, are permeating the market, the, uh, the development houses need to need to outsource some component of what they're doing, whether that's in my case the, the legal side of it, um, but in, in, in other cases as well, whether it's uh, marketing or QA or, or the money side of it. Uh, so I brought together a few people here today. We have one cancellation on, on our speaker side. But uh, what we're going to do is just a real general free-form uh, discussion about what uh, we look for in clients, what, what you should look for in your various service providers in any area, and, and how we all can work more effectively together uh, going forward and how we can best help you. So uh, I've got uh, Steve Fowler here uh, to my left, and then on the other side of him is Stu Kasoy. And I'm going to let them talk a little bit about their background and, and what, what services they provide for their clients and games and, and what the value add is from there. And then I think we'll, we're just going to sort of uh, rip around the room a little bit. So I'm just going to sit this well. Steve Fowler. I'm a general manager for a company called Alis Games. Alis Games is a, is a digital publisher. Um, but nowadays, publishing has a much different definition than it used to. So. Uh, we're not in the uh, traditional sense of an Activision or EA. We're actually an offshoot of a marketing agency called Eisenberg Group. And Eisenberg Group's been focused on the video game space for the last 15 years exclusively. Eisenberg Group partners up with big publishers. So their clients are Activision, EA, Microsoft, you name it, Sony. And uh, you know, about three or four years ago, we really started to pay attention to what digital was going to do to change the space. And as a company who provides marketing services to the games business, we were taken aback uh, with the emergence of and the speed to market of some of these digital uh, game publishers, guys like Zynga or Chilingo, who came out of nowhere and have no idea who Eisenberg was. And so we needed to rectify that. We needed to be able to pivot. There's another, another conference right over here that was talking about pivoting a lot. Uh, we pivoted as well, and, and we started to analyze the digital business, started to better understand what game developers needed who were making the digital products, what they didn't necessarily need, and how we could partner with them to provide services for them. And our services are primarily driving customers to their products and keeping them there and wanting them to spend money in their products. Uh, and so kind of when I'm up here, I'm representing both sides. So we do, uh, on the A-list side, one of the things that we need to be able to do is be able to provide better um, ways to financially partner with us. A lot of these are small independents, don't have a lot of uh, disposable income, but they might have brilliant ideas. And, and if we love those ideas, we might want to invest our own money into marketing those products. And so we'll take um, some of the risk on ourselves and, and partner on a rev share basis on the back end. All the way up to full Activision or EA, who pays up front for our services, and we do giant, beautiful CG trailers for them and everything else. So um, that's, that's what I represent. I am Stu Kasoy with uh, Digital Capital. I've uh, been doing games more than 25 years. Started out designing and producing. Uh, about the last 11 years, I was an agent representing developers. And during my career, I saw many times saw people come with money into the business, looking to get into the business. And I would say to myself, there goes someone who's going to lose their shirt. Because they would always <laughs> invest the money in the wrong people. Uh, about a year ago, I met some people who actually had money and were interested, and they convinced me to give up being an agent. And we now have a company that funds almost exclusively digital projects. Um, we've been in business actually incorporated in December. Uh, first real show was GDC in San Francisco. Since then, we've seen 300 pitches. Mm. Of those 300 pitches, 20 were worth further view, and we funded one. One's already in alpha. Uh, we've got two more that are about to close. And if you have an idea that really is sound, and you understand your market, and the big number is you know how to monetize, you have a real good plan for monetizing that product, we're very interested in what uh, The main, I guess, differentiating factor of our company is we don't want to own your company. We do project funding. We create joint venture with the creative partner. The creative partner owns 50% of the joint venture, so you don't have to give up your IP. Uh, we 
pay the investor back 120%, and then everything else is split according to the partnership. So it's a really a uniquely fair proposition for developers if you know how to do what you're doing. So, so I come at this from the legal perspective. Obviously, I, I'm a lawyer and I represent game companies and, and I've been doing it for a dozen years or so. Uh, one of the things that I deal with all the time is uh, my clients or my potential clients, obviously, they, they view me as a cost center, not a profit center. Right? Nobody, <laughs> wants to, nobody wants to pay a legal bill. But, uh, but I, I want to get their perspective on, um, you know, on, on particularly the, the value add because you, you both sort of changed your focus over the last few years. But uh, how has the value add to your clients changed? Obviously, you know, Steve, with, uh, with the Eisenberg side, uh, you know, Activision comes to you, they know exactly what they want, they know exactly the value they're getting. But how, how do you uh, quantify the value and how do you educate your clients on the value and on the new things you do? Well, obviously in the digital space, you can't go a day without seeing an article about discoverability is an issue and nobody can find my great product on iOS and nobody can see, uh, you know, there's 10 new Facebook games and Zynga's gobbled up all the market and I can't use viral capabilities because Facebook took that all away from me and Tapjoy got their hand slapped because they were doing referral engine crap. Well, guess what? You need to market your products. And so that's what we've been doing for the last 15 years is understanding how to get gamers excited about games. It isn't necessary. I, I have an issue with the word discoverability because that, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Just because someone knows your product exists doesn't mean they're going to be interested, that they're going to try it, that they're going to reach out and talk to their friends about it. There's a whole process that is being leapfrogged and left behind by the new emerging digital market space. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of really smart, really creative um, folks are, are putting out products with the thought that, hey, if I just make a great game, people will find it. And, and they're going to have to be, most of them are going to have to learn at, through failure, pivot, and then come back and figure out what they need to do to get discoverability first, which is, is like I said, that's a, that's a small, small sliver of it. But awareness, branding, purchase intent, retention, monetization, we're not, talk, we're not talking about products anymore, we're talking about services. So you need to keep the customers fans, right? You need to keep them loyal. And this is what what we can bring, right? That's the value that we can bring is that I've got at my, at my disposal, I've got 120 staff of people that do that all day long, right? I, I know how to make great creative assets that will give you visibility, discoverability. We also have community management teams, community engagement teams that can manage all the social outreach, make sure that you're getting conversation going and that it's, it's response times within minutes, not days. Um, that is huge in the new in the new uh, digital space, and it's a very low cost um, experience. We have professional PR, public relations people, those those people that work not only with the big AAA game spots and IGNs, but all the way down to the grassroots blogger level. Um, you know, our our PR outreach list when I was at Microsoft 15 years ago was about 25 sites. Now it's about 2,500 sites, and that's just for the U.S. So, you know, the value add is that these really creative game designers and developers are great at that, and they're not so good at this other stuff. So um, we're, we're really good at that. I don't propose, propose that I, I know how to make a game, I don't know how to write code, I don't, I'm not an artist, but I can, I can get gamers really excited about uh, your products. Okay, um, what we bring that's different. Um, basically a whole new way of approaching game funding. Like I said, been in the business for a long time. First thing is, if somebody saw your game, you had to give it up. Uh, no big publisher would take your product by insisting they own the IP. And it would be pretty much a work for hire. You would finish it and throw the code over the door and you were done. Uh, we look at it entirely different. We're partnering them with you. We're funding the development. We're funding a live period. When I do a budget to greenlight a game, there's the cost of the development. We figure approximately six months funding for the live. You know, uh, the analogy the horse is born, it can't even stand up. Two weeks later, it's galloping after mile. You launch a product, a digital product, it, it needs time to gestate, to, to get and start earning. That's part of the budget. And we also include a significant marketing budget. Now, we're not market guys. We're not marketing guys. I'm a product guy. And one of the things that we all agreed, have two partners, we all agreed is that we know what we know. We know what we don't know. We don't know marketing. We know how to find people to do marketing. So we would go to people like you, or others, depending, 
and on a project by project basis to find the best possible marketing partner to fit in with the project. So you're not stuck with one, one marketing company. Uh, and at the end of the day, you have a much better chance of recouping and getting into a profit by going in our direction. Well, that's one of the, I mean, that's one of the, uh, the value adds I think that, that you guys bring and, and I think I bring as well. But uh, you know, let's, let's talk about the importance of that. The, the idea that not only do you, you know certain things really well, but you also know other people to get in front of, right? Yes. Um, and obviously with, with your side, with your agency experience, um, you know, know, knowing what's out there, knowing the marketplace, knowing a comparable deal, uh, you know, knowing the right people to talk to, you know, if, if somebody needs uh, you know, an engine license or whatever, you know, yes. you talk, talk a little bit about, about that value, because I think that's important in the service product. Uh, well, um, I put on oil in business, personally. Um, mm -hmm. They came to me when I was a VPGT interactive with the first Unreal, and they didn't even have enemies around them. And I had marketing in my office, and we them leave for six hours until we signed the, the deal and had funded it. So from, from Unreal on, there are many people, I mean, it's like I know where to go, and I know, if I don't know specifically, I, I certainly know quite a few people in the business after 30 years to get done what needs to be done. Uh, and art sourcing, outsourcing for art, or any other type of subset of the business, these are things that I've done for 25, 20 years. So it's, it's, that service is what we bring as part, not only the money, but that expertise is part of the partnership. You know, you're bringing your idea and often the team to develop it. But not necessarily, I mean, people come to us with a really cool idea, and they know that they did not team to develop it. But if we believe it's a, a solid idea, we'll, we'll join with them, help them find the team. I mean, the, one of the projects we're working on right now, uh, they completely outside team. They had a really great idea. They looked at each other and went, this is fantastic. Do you understand that you're not capable of developing that? They went, absolutely. So we partnered up with them, took three, three potential clients, uh, developers, put them together, and then the idea partner picked the one they wanted to work with so that everybody was happy with the force it down and about it. So those kind of things are value add for sure. You know, one, one of the other things that, uh, you know, that I want to touch on, uh, obviously I think it's more, more, uh, more directly pertinent for, for you, Stu, but uh, in all of our businesses uh, as service providers, we have to pick when we have an opportunity to cost at how many clients we're going to work with. You, know, you, you more directly, I think, than, than even Steve and I. Uh, but you know, so sort of what's what's critical mass as far as you know? Well, I think for a number of projects or a number of clients, but but also how how do you go about choosing your clients and how do you, you know? Because because we're we're investing in them to a certain degree too. Obviously, not in the same way uh, as you are, but but uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, when I go out and look at a or look at a proposal, I'm looking for people that understand their target demographic. They have to explain to me that they really understand why it's different or better. Um, to give an example, at uh, GDC, a guy came up to us and said, I want to show you a first person shooter. I went, okay. There's a lot of first person shooters, but I'll, I'll sit, hello. They brought in six laptops. Uh, we were on the upper floor of the hotel at security there. Five minutes after we started playing, the security guy ran into our room because we were screaming so loud because this game was so good that we were all sweating and screaming at each other. And it was stick figures and blocks. I mean, these guys had it. And then we're still now working with them on the monetization side. So the first first step is you have a really good idea. And I don't care the genre. I mean, it could be a sewing game. I don't care. If it addresses a market that's an identifiable market and you have a unique or way to address it, that's really strong. You also really have to be able to understand how to monetize the project. Traditionally, a developer would do the game and give it to the publisher, and the publisher would make a guarantee or whatever, the advance, and the publisher had to sell it. It's like, here, here's a box, go sell it. Um, it's not that way anymore. With the digital distribution, you have to continually adjust it. You have to have a solid monetization plan. 
and I look very closely at that. Typically, I look at what someone gives me, and I often quarter the numbers mm -hmm. and because I like to under promise and over deliver. So if you if you tell somebody you're going to sell a million units and you sell a half a million, that's a failure. If you tell somebody you're going to sell a quarter million units and you sell the same half a million units, you're a hero. Mm -hmm. Do the numbers work at a quarter million units? Is that a real realistic number, whatever that number is, that you can achieve without zooming to the first place? And if that's the case and those numbers didn't work, we add in the marketing and the live, and then we put together a proposal that I bring back to my partners. So it's really, do you have a passion? Have you identified a, a segment of the market? It doesn't have to be unique, but a segment of the market that you can address differently and better than before, and you understand how to monetize it. Those are like the three big points. So basically take your projections, if you're gonna pitch this deal, and multiply them by four before you see them. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. There you go. You can do that. Uh, I'm ruthless with that. I'm, I'm ruthless with that, Ben. What, what about you, Steve? What do you look for when you're looking to potentially invest in a, in a marketing plan or, or really you know, go down the road on these things? Right, well, on, on the Eisenberg side, we're we're loose, we'll sleep with anybody, right. because you're paying us up front. <laughs> right. On the A-list side, yes, for sure, since we're, we're risking our own money, there's, we're much more selective there. And I think it has uh, a lot to do with um, product, the, the people, and the opportunity. So the product has got to excite us, it's got to fit what our portfolio strategy is, and that changes day by day, right? Uh, mobile's hot, and you know, casual's not anymore, and uh, uh, maybe not casual as a whole, but Facebook, for instance, is, is losing steam a bit. Um, so we're, you know, looking at other areas, right? Um, from a personality standpoint, you're going to be doing a lot of business and spending a lot of time with these people. If the personalities don't match, I don't. It doesn't really matter if the product's great for us because we're never going to end up in a good spot because we're we're creating creative for creative people. And so if we don't just get along. When I go and build your, your PR messaging, or I go and build your trailer, or I go build your website, or we come up with a, a, a social strategy, and we just don't mesh there, it's never gonna, it's never gonna work. Because more of the time, I'm, uh, I've got artists on my team that, are trying, that I'm trying to interpret art to, to other artists. Um, and then last is the opportunity. So do we think financially, right, running the numbers, do we think we can make money here? Um, what's the competition look like? What, uh, what is the market, you know, uh, what platforms are we on? What sort of investment total in do we have to, to make? What sort of contract terms can I get? Um, how much do I have to pay my lawyer to write up those contract terms? <laughs> um, those sorts of things. Right. Now, you know, coming from my perspective, uh, again, you know, uh, the law firm model is, is more like the Eisenberg model, right? You know, it's, it's um, you're getting paid up front more or less anyway. So, uh, but within that model, even, even in, in what I do, there, there is still a critical mass and there's only so many clients that, that, that I personally can take on and I can service. My firm can obviously you know, do a lot of other things for a lot of, uh, a lot of different clients. But uh, you know, I'm also at the point where I, I like to work with clients that have an interesting project and have something uh, that I think will be enjoyable to work on, right? And there's, there's plenty of clients who uh, are, are willing to pay that, quite honestly, you're just kind of boring. And, um, yeah, I'll take their money, but uh, <laughs> but it's it's more fun to work on something that I think is more interesting. I think, you know, at, at this point, so that's uh, that's what I look for. Uh, you know, a client that I'm trying to help build something. So, uh, but I think uh, you know, I, I don't take a piece of a deal. I don't do a rev share. So you know, it, it has to be a semi well funded client with an interesting idea, at least uh, from, <laughs> from a law firm perspective. So, um, what do you what do you guys think the clients are looking for? Uh, again, uh, uh, Stu's is a little obvious. Money. Yeah. <laughs> but what else? I mean, there's there's obviously more money. <laughs> but, but what else? I mean, what else? Um, seriously, I think that not only is there money, I think the deal structure that we have is very unique. Um, I was talking to a prospective partner who at one time was. Uh, the CEO of the regional branch of Electronic Arts. And after I laid out the deal structure, he looked at me and goes, EA would never do that. Because they have, they have a big engine. A, big, a lot of coal has to go in that boiler. And we're a small group. Uh, we don't have a, a fixed infrastructure, a lot of overhead. So there's a deal structure. 
And I think that they're also looking for the expertise. Because, well, I have two partners, but I'm the gaming guy. I've been doing games 28 years, whatever. And I've written them, designed them, produced them. So I have a fairly good idea of how games work. And now that I'm an absolute you know, golden whale in that in the online free-to-play game, put $800, does that make you a golden whale or a platinum whale? Uh, <laughs> I'll put $800 into a world of tanks. I love the game. They made it for me. And, and they did, and it's like amazing how much fun for me, and it's worth it. That's for me, just as an aside, that's about ten cents a game because I've I've played eight thousand battles, so it's cheaper than a coin drop, you know, and I love it. And so, but I understand from playing that game, I learned about the free to play model and how to do different currencies, um, and we bring that expertise to the table. And I think that's some of one of the things we're looking. Because traditionally, people that brought bring money were much higher up, and from not from product development so much as finance or management, and they didn't have the perspective of what does it take to get a game out the door. Slept <laughs> under a desk to ship the title. On. I've done that on many occasions, and so I really know what it takes to to uh, sell titles, and I think people see that. Well, I mean, I, you know, again, I, I certainly hope so because. Yeah, again, in my business model, I pay charge by the hour, and you know, if you're if you're simply pricing it by, you know, the hourly rate, you know, my clients are going to go somewhere else, right? And mm -hmm. I'm not the cheapest, I'm not the most expensive in the world, but uh, but you hope that they, they see the extra value, and, you know, you want something there. What about you? Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's certainly expertise, as as Stu says. Um, you know, I give you a, an example. Um, we also are very deep and have been for a long time in the free play space, so. Um, for instance, uh, six and a half years ago, Nexon came to the U.S. Min Kim and John Chi sat in our office and said, we're gonna bring these amazing products that are just ridiculously profitable in Asia to Western markets, and let me show you them. And they showed us MapleStory. And it's this little two-dimensional bit sprite MMO. We're like, okay, Good. All right. So, what are you gonna? What do you want to do with this? Well, we want to make this in every every uh, you know 16 year old's home be synonymous with Pokemon or anything else. Okay. What's your business plan? Well, we give it away. Really? How do you make money? Well, we sell pets and we sell weddings and we sell uh, trinkets. And at that point in time, free to play was nothing in the West. It was an unknown commodity. It was really only seen by us as game developers as a way to avoid piracy, which was so prolific in the East, it was just a necessity, right? It wasn't a viable business model. Oh, it wasn't at that piracy, right? Right, right. And so we're like, great, okay, well, okay, they have money. And we, we did the due diligence, then they're a very well, you know, very profitable company in Korea. So we're saying, okay, well, give us your marketing plans, we'll build you a campaign, and we'll, we'll fire this off. And they're like, no, 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 you guys gotta write them up. There's, it's us, it's us two guys here. We have no idea how to bring these games to the US or to Europe. We need your help doing that. And so we spent, a long, long time investing into Nexon, which has actually turned out to be extremely successful, obviously. Um, they've gone on and really, I think, pioneered free-to-play as a business model in the West, and we were lucky enough to be partners with, and still are great partners with them, in figuring out how to message that type of um, market, uh, that type of business to, to consumers in the West. And so, fast forward to A-list games, we've taken that expertise and allowed smaller, more independents to come and tap into that expertise while at the same time us taking risk with them because we're, we're investing our own money into that marketing. So it's, it's expertise, um, but it's also, uh, you know, it's, it's value, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a bunch of stuff, right? So the so law firm model is predicated on, on the platform, right? So I do one thing, but my firm has an employment group and a litigation group and a patent group and a trademark group. Can you guys talk about how how scalable your, your, your offerings are, right? And, and, and yours, I, I imagine, is less scalable than, than probably Steve's as far as, as far as the services you provide. Your money is money, right? But, but there, are, there are things that on top of it, some, some probably require more production than others, right? And, and a little more oversight. So can you guys talk about the scalability of what of your services? Well, um, first is the money. But on every project we do, we have an executive producer that oversees the development. And right now we have just one. Um, 
and he's overseeing all the projects. And as we grow, we'll hire another one. Uh, and they have a wealth of experience in an area that's not the same as mine. So the different projects, different teams, different projects need different kind of help. And so between the general lab now, Derek is and myself, as far as the product and, and support, if we need somebody else, we can bring them in and help them along. We do, we do tend to focus, because we're very small, uh, on teams we think don't need a lot of handholding. Um, it's kind of the Nintendo philosophy. Back in the day when I was representing developers, you got a project with Nintendo, instead of having monthly milestones, they'd come every quarter, sit in your accomplish room and smoke cigarettes all day, and say, we like this, here's another half million, I want to see what the trees play like. Maybe the character a tree. And then they go away for six months, and they come back and they say, no, uh, do something else. But they expect you to know how to make a game. Mm -hmm. And we really don't have the bandwidth to work with someone that doesn't know how to make a game. So if they have a really good idea, that's when we would partner them, partner them up with an existing developer with that expertise. Um, it's kind of limiting, but right now it's all that. Yeah. And what about you, Steve? Some some clients probably need more PR than you know more certain kind of work. So so how do you yeah scalability? So um, yeah, it depends on the the the, the publisher developer that we're partnering with. So uh, example, um, our first two games that we've publicly kind of co-published. Um, one of them is a, a smaller developer called Arctos on a game called War Inc. It's a free-to-play first-person shooter. The other one is a, a larger uh, publisher for APB Reloaded, and each of them have different staffing and skill sets. So, so War Inc. is a bunch of guys that write code, and that's, that's about it. So they, scalability, they, they need everything. That, you know, they throw everything at us because we don't have it here. Where APB's got a marketing team of sorts, right? They've placed and bought some of their own media. They've done their own PR outreach. Um, they've dabbled a bit in, in, in customer retention models. And so, yeah, we can, we can, we can provide and fill, fill holes and fill gaps depending on where they need it. Where we tend to be more efficient, though, is when we're involved in all of the executions. Um, it just, as a marketing campaign, it, it always I've found in my 15 years in doing marketing for video games that the more well integrated it is, the more successful that it is, the more economies of scale you garner from that. So when you start siloing out your marketing activities and getting a PR agency that just does this sort of PR and then getting a social company that just does this social and outsourcing your, your trailer development to this guy over here, that just puts a bunch of work on you to try to make sure all those people are doing the same things and saying the same things. And inevitably, they'll never look like they, they could if it was all being handled by one kind of master group who's, who's got the best interest in it. And of course, we don't, on the ALA side, we don't make any money unless the game makes money. So it's in our best interest to make that as, as you know, kick ass as possible of a campaign. As immersive and as early on. And yeah, I mean it's the same thing. I believe I have clients who call you know call me up and say, "I've already negotiated this deal. Can you look us over because we're signing today?" Okay, wow. um, that's great. And, uh, I'm happy to do that work, and I'll fill you the half hour or whatever it's going to take. But uh, but I don't feel like I'm adding a whole lot of value to that. And, and I think you know the earlier you get involved, and, and the more you know what your clients are working on and, and how they work, I think that's the better the relationship. I think I think it comes down to even trying to remove the word client and, and, and really be partners. Um, you know. We're, the more you treat us as a vendor, the less efficiency you'll get out of us. Mm -hmm. um, if you just see us as a risk that's pushing around Photoshop assets and giving you a, a, a beautiful rendered photo, then that's great. You'll, you'll, you'll do what you want with that. But when you really sit down with us and want to engage and, and try to, because we're, we're gamer geeks as well, right? We just we didn't grow up writing C++, but we did grow up, you know, playing playing Nintendo DS and, 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 and Sega Genesis games. and. And we love the, the art, right? We just we're wired that way. We're wired a different way. So. Right. No, it's just, it's probably no different than if you know if you guys are going to hire a, a programmer, you're going to hire you know the, the, the best program that's the best fit. And, uh, you know, it's probably no different. You want to hire the best fit, I think, on, on the service side. So. Um, so what do you what do you see as the future of your serv the, the, the services you provide? Like, so how how are you? What's your growth plan? How, how many projects will you 
aspire to in a given year? Can we talk a little bit about critical mass? Well, when we first put this together, uh, we were thinking two a year, and now, you know, four months later, we're thinking five or six in the first year, and maybe six to eight in the second year. Um, there is amazing amount of money out there, and there are a lot of people that are very talented coming into the field. So it's really, uh, quite frankly, in my current situation, my bottleneck is taking projects that I believe in and putting together a coherent presentation. Taking from my gut reaction to say this is really good to putting it on a piece of paper to present to somebody whose first language isn't English mm -hmm. and having them say, yeah, I, I see that. You know, so we're working on it, we got a couple done. But that's, that's that the other staff is doing that. You know, there's some very talented people out there for producing staff. And we outsource the marketing to the talented people like that. Can that include you? Makes sense. Get a good body. I like the market. <laughs> <laughs> We're the same way. We don't make money unless everybody makes money. Right. Yeah. We're all in. Uh, I think that the, it's, a, it's an interesting question because I have to take it differently. What's the future? I think for, for our craft, um, what we're finding is marketing, advertising is is completely different now in the digital space. And, mm -hmm. and that you've got to approach it as a service-based mentality and that old old techniques are, are less efficient than they are uh, currently. So um, if I was to forecast in the future, I can tell you that some of the things that we've experimented with recently that have been successful revolve around content. So building original content around a game product uh, and then building communications around that. So direct communication with your fans. Just as you're going directly to your, your, your gamers with the distribution, so should the marketing be direct to the, to the consumer. So I'll give a, a, a real life case study. Uh, with APB, for instance, last holiday, we did a, a marketing campaign uh, for that game where we did a live action trailer. And uh, if, if anybody's played the game, it's kind of like Grand Theft Auto Online, but it's got this amazing customization tool in it where you can basically create your character to look anything possibly dream of. There, there are clans in the game that all dress up as Power Rangers. And there's another clan that's all like McDonald's characters, like Ham <laughs> Burglar and Ronald McDonald. And, it's cool. And so you can completely express yourself. And we wanted to bring that out in a video. And so we shot this kick-ass live action piece, downtown LA. Um, we showed both sides, the criminal and the, and the enforcer side, and cast these, these, um, these actors for this. And then they would do these in-camera changes where you know she could, one girl would start out as a punk rock girl, and as she's walking the camera, she lift off her shirt, and then all of a sudden she's now uh, like a schoolgirl outfit. Or the guy was suit and tie, and then he kind of shakes his head at camera, and he turns into a police, a cop man, a cop, right? But what we wanted to do is obviously we knew we were going to make a really cool and interesting, compelling video content, but it's more than that. It's like, what, what can you do with that, that asset to maximize conversation and distribution? And so we had the idea to enlist, uh, enlist um, YouTube celebrities. So you know what's going on on YouTube right now, what kids are doing on YouTube. They're very much not watching TV for their, their main entertainment. They're going to these YouTube channels, and there are these celebrities on YouTube, some of them are more well-known than others, who have massive followings, even bigger than cable networks, right? Um, Freddie Wong is probably the, the biggest known uh, out there now, but there's many, many others than that. And they have specialties, and they have unique followers, and those unique followers, if you study these YouTube celebrities, you can apply to your game, depending on what the type of, you know, if, you, if your game is a fantasy game or if it's a sci-fi game or whatever, there are different YouTuber celebrities. So we, we targeted four and we offered, we called them up directly, we offered them uh, the ability to be um, an extra in our shoot. So we're gonna dress them up in punk rocker costumes and they could video blog their whole experience. And we said, po post anything you want to on your channel. Just tell them about your experience. And so we shot it, they had a great time. That night, um, one guy in particular, C Nanners, as he goes by, um, he posted a video blog of just him on a webcam and standing in front of his, his computer talking, saying, hey, I was at this cool thing, and they dressed me up as a punk rocker, and uh, there were some hot chicks there, and hey, they're going to make this video, you should watch it, it's going to come out pretty soon. Overnight, that, that video got 350,000 views in the span of about eight hours of just him talking to his webcam. 
the algorithms of YouTube pick up on what's hot and post those on the front page. And so when we woke up in the morning, we looked at the front page, and there, lo and behold, was our little promo, promo from CNANners. And above that, which was interesting, and I think it shows the, where marketing is going, was a Call of Duty um, takeover unit, right? One of those big drop-down banner ads that shows the video in it. To buy that for one day on the homepage of YouTube is $150,000. I paid CNANners 1200 bucks, and I, and I fed him uh, craft services. And I had an ad basically right underneath the uh, Activision's Call of Duty ad. Um, and then fast forward, we actually had several of those put out prior to our trailer being released. So these other YouTubers started basically building hype and anticipation for the trailer that we were going to be releasing later on. And so there was this big pent up um, demand for a video asset that we were building, right? Content. So when that video asset actually did come out, it had a, had, a, had a following for it, and it spiked through the roof, and these guys then pointed to it from their channels and ended up with somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, like 8 million total views of this video piece that we did. And then in addition to that, we then incentivized these YouTube celebrities to try to drive traffic into the game. So one of the issues that you have, even if you're buying performance media, I'm getting really granular here, but Sorry. Uh, if you buy performance media, CPA media, right, you're paying on cost per acquisition. The media vendor that you're buying from will define what that acquisition is. Sometimes that's not low enough in the funnel and there's inefficiencies there. Sometimes it'll just be um, a confirmed registration. So if you go on to your, your free-to-play PC game, it says, what's your name, your user address, your email, right? You say submit, it sends you an email, and you go, yes, I confirm this. You'll have to pay the media vendor for that. They haven't downloaded the game, they haven't patched the game. They might be on a Mac and you only run it on PC, you're still paying for that. So there's inefficiency in that process, especially for our game, APB, which is, is, is a taxing game on your, you need a pretty big rig to run this thing. So one of the ways that we wanted to fix that and, and learn in the new digital economy is how can we pay lower in the funnel for acquisitions? So for YouTubers, we told them, hey, if you guys actually get someone to log into the game from your custom URL, we gave them their own custom funnel, then I'll pay you a, a, a bounty for that, right? And so what's great is they have the ability to do that because then they all said, okay, great. They go, they post a video and they say, hey, tonight on this server at this time, I'm gonna log on, come on and play with me. It's a free game, it's pretty cool. And they drove a tremendous amount of traffic, all much more efficient because we're only paying for users that we knew could run the game. Um, so there's, I don't know what the initial part of this question was. It kind of been <laughs> lost. But yeah, we're learning a lot about how, it's future, right? Yeah. Where's the, so the, the marketing practices are changing just as fast as the distribution and the game contents are changing. So um, make sure that whoever you partner with from a marketing capacity, if you're gonna do it yourself or you're gonna outsource it, make sure that they're paying attention to what's going on because just throwing money at TV and, and IGN is, is, is gonna be inefficient. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think the you know, the future question ties to what I think all of us have, you know, have some uh, you know, some aspect of, which is the, the, the nimbleness of a service provider, right? You know, it, we we're not stuck in a portfolio strategy that's you know a five year plan. You know, when you say you know we might do six or eight projects in year two, who knows? If things explode, it might be twelve, ten, or twelve. I mean, you're you're able to move on your feet, right? Yeah. And and and, and obviously, I think you know more directly, I think. Uh, you know, I think Steve and what they're doing on the marketing side is, is by definition moving on your feet and being nimble. So, um, you know, it's 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 scalable and, and, and nimble by you know by definition. And I think I think we all strive to at least share that. I think law firms maybe even a little bit less than than, than a marketing company. Uh, you know, can, can be nimble, but uh, but we certainly try. So, um, those are all the questions I had. You, you did anything you guys want to talk about or cover, or, or any questions that you have? So the three of you talked about bandwidth of your organizations, in that uh, there, there may be dozens, hundreds of people who want to make use of your services. You have to be, you have to pick and choose, and, and there's a, uh, there's an opportunity cost associated with taking one, leaving another. Uh, so imagine a world which that's a little bit reversed, right? In which you guys need the client. What would you do? What was the what would the philosophy be? Because you're dealing with, in a lot of cases, maybe small to mid-sized organizations that don't have tons of money to throw out. Uh, they're not a huge AAA studio. What would you do to talk to largely creative people? What they really want to be doing is making games. They don't want to necessarily have to spend money on marketing. They don't want to spend money on legal costs and these sorts of things. What would your philosophy be to land 
such a client? What would you tell somebody in that organization to make them go, oh, I see the value there. Yes, I want to pay you to do this, this, and this. Well, let me start with the legal side, and, and, then, and then we'll move to the more interesting side. Um, from, from the legal side, we do offer some alternative fee arrangements depending on the type of client and depending on what we're going to do. Uh, so we can talk about you know, how to make it more cost efficient for, for a potential client. But, uh, but also more from the experience side, what, what I sell is the fact that the process is going to be more efficient, right? The, the, the deal or whatever it is that you're hiring me will run more efficiently because you're, you're hiring my expertise. And, and that resonates because uh, a lot of clients who, who just want to make games, like, like you're saying and like you're describing, don't want to have to talk to their lawyer and explain their business and explain, uh, well, I don't care about this or I like, you know, they don't, they don't want to get too granular with them because it's going to distract them. And what I bring to the table is, having done this for as many years as I have and, and the couple hundred games that I've, that I've worked on, is you don't have to hold my hand. I already know your business. So, so I can work more efficiently through that and not bother the clients to let, let the client focus on what they want to do. So it's, it's an experience side and it's obviously there's a, a cost side that you, you have to always try, try work with on the client side. So the question, what, what's, what's our sales pitch to a partner, basically? Essentially. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, you know, it, it, there's, there's a couple of different ways to think about it. There is, um, do, you, do you want to make more money? Um, you can not market your game and see how it does by itself, or you can come with us. It's, it's a, it's a cost-benefit analysis, right? You're going to give up some of the revenue on the back end uh, in order for us to more than likely bring you a lot more users and monetize those users better than you could have done by yourself. Um, you can really get granular and just talk analytics, and we, we can do that all day long if you want to talk about what sort of CPAs we can do versus what the market can do, what you personally can do, uh, what sort of retention levels we can do, how we can add to uh, retention, what sort of monetization increases we've been able to see with other partners, how we might be able to expect to do something similar based on what your product um, offers. Um, it, it goes back to earlier as well, which is the expertise, right? We're selling a little bit of that, right? So you, you, you certainly will want to know what our pedigree is and who the, who the people on my team are and why they know what they know and why they're any better at it than anybody else. Um, that's part of the sales pitch. Um, case studies are also a good part of the sales pitch. So, um, With us, I'm a gamer. And if I get your game and I see it, you'll see it in my face and I'll lose it. Uh, there are people, other people out there that will give you money, possibly. I don't think anybody that will give you a better deal than me will. Uh, you'll wind up owning still part of the game, you co owner of the game, and you'll get the support that needs uh, for marketing, for the live, and for doing the work. Been doing it a really long time, and I don't get excited very often. When I get excited, I'm not a good poker player. You'll see it. <laughs> you you want to have someone that's a partner. It's like you said, we don't look at clients. It's not clients, it's partners. We're going to be partners. Life's too short for bullshit, part of my language. You know, uh, I'm not EA or Activision. I don't need a slate of titles. I don't need to, you know, if we don't do any in the year because we haven't found one, that's perfectly okay. As it happened, I've had more, more World of Tanks time. Right. <laughs> I, I made them. <laughs> Three in the morning, we're, we're playing World of Tanks. We used to get a couple of that. But seriously, if, if you were looking for, you know, our sales pitch is this here we are, we're interested, we love what you got. Let's see what can make it work. And, and that ties back into that, that same partnership aspect. I mean, a, a lot of my sales pitch, a lot of my value add are, are, are sitting right up here, right? You know, my, my clients would say, you know, I, I don't have a deal for you, but you know, but boy, I really need a marketing company. You know, or really, you know, and I, I, I'm pitching my clients to other clients. I'm always trying to marry them up, and and that doesn't cost them anything, right? So, uh, not not every lawyer can do that, or you know, to the degree that that, that I hope I can. Um, so that's part of the sales pitch as well. Is is, is you get the community to get the role in it. Mm -hmm. oh. Go. Oh, I was talking about It was you um, too. Yeah, Tara McCoy from Pickpock in New Zealand. Uh, we're a developer team publisher, been developing games in the console space for a long time. <coughs> and um, I guess us moving into the publishing space, uh, you know, we provide a number of services. You guys are kind of providing specific services. 
how much aggregation have you seen uh, of services and providers? You know, we provide QA legal counsel through our, our partners, um, uh, product development capability, investment, the whole shebang. How much sort of more traditional publishing are you seeing in the mobile space at the moment? I think he's asking um, how much we see um, a traditional publisher moving into the mobile space. Because what you're saying, you're providing financing and legal and marketing, and, and that's the traditional publisher role. Yeah. I think a lot of the big publishers are frantically trying to get there. Um, they have a very big uh, handicap in that they have this enormous brick and mortar infrastructure yeah. that they have to blow up somehow because it's very expensive, but you don't want to alienate. So, but I do see a lot of companies big companies going that way. Um, We're effectively aggregating that informally on a modular basis, right? You know, yeah. when I'm when I'm saying to my clients, oh, you need a marketing service, you can talk to Steve, I mean, we're, we're effectively doing that without the overhead, so I think there's some cost efficiencies to, to being able to do it that way. Yeah, I think that um, digital publishing is, uh, like I said at the very beginning, is is changing the word publisher greatly. Um, it, it used to be, or it still is now in the, in the brick and mortar world, all of that is internal, and which is the bloat and the overhead and the cost that Stu's referring to, where we're now much more nimble, and we can go to um, experts in per service. Um, so, for instance, you know, we may we may make a, a an advertorial mobile game, right? But I don't have a developer on staff. I'll go to the right developer to get that done. I don't have QA on staff, but I've got partners that'll do QA for me. I don't have localization, but I know the right localization company to go to. And those things end up making me more efficient than having to pay those staff and waiting for them to have a project. Mm -hmm. We got about five more minutes for a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, so, I'm I'm more of a dev than a suit, but I, I find myself having to ride that line a lot a lot more often than I than I want to. Um, and this, you know, you guys speak of it's all about the money, and and from your perspective, it is. From ours, it doesn't seem to be as as high of a priority in some cases. Um, I mean, it's it's obviously part of the equation, but I'm wondering where you get that reconciliation between the marketing, which seems to be it's 99% about money, and the dev, who seems must, much less concerned about that. And, and how you reconcile those, those relationships with, within that question of, it's all about the money. Um, a long time ago, someone came to me with a product. Uh, I was working at a publisher, it was brilliant, like, it was brilliant product, it was beautiful. And I suggested that he find a patron because he was doing art. And it was beautiful art, and I would buy it. But the game business is show business. And then if you don't have business, you don't have a show. Mm -hmm. So you could have a really good game, and you could be totally focused on delivering that game. But if you can't figure out a way to monetize it, and the marketing is a critical aspect of that, it has to be accounted for from the beginning. You need to find a patron because you're not going to make it. I mean, I don't mean to be rude, but it's, you know, I get excited about the games because I wrote games, I designed games, I'm a game guy. <laughs> but I learned long ago that there's an opportunity cost. And you can't just make games that you love, it, that's art. If you make games that make money, then you make games for living. But that's also on a continuum, right? If you're if you're less concerned about that, but you still are, you know, you still obviously want to make money, then then you want to be working with people who can take some of those things off your plate and make you more efficient. But but yeah, in, in the purest sense, he's right. I mean, if it's it's, it's only about making uh, making the game, then then you probably don't need any of this. Yeah, I I echo that. That's what I was thinking. If if you're just doing it for your own happiness, then you probably don't need any of that stuff here. Right? You only need a small amount of other people who think that that's cool, and you can probably find them yourself. But if it's if it's tied to a business model, then you know then we can help with that. So some of the efficiencies in a different ways, yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing you you mentioned, I'm kind of a dinosaur myself, and uh, they used to uh, look at companies for acquisition. For, uh, the same um, years ago, and we would always, you know, have to put an NDA in place to make sure that ideas weren't uh, you know, swept. Um, today, in this marketplace, the brilliant idea is 95% of the product. Because you can find 
someone to go out and build it. Yes. How do you get someone with a brilliant idea to open up to you and trust that that brilliant idea isn't going to go somewhere else? We have a very four-page mutual NDA that we won't talk to anybody with unless we have that in, in place. It's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I've known a long time, but I was talking to someone today. They started mentioning an idea they had. I said, excuse me, this is something too close to something that we're looking at. I really don't want to talk about this anymore because I don't want to, I don't even want to be contaminated. Right. You know, it's, it's, what? Like, I used to do manager developer relations, which was BizDev for Sega. People would send in unsolicited ideas. Mm -hmm. I created an escrow, and we wrote an anti-NDA that said, we can look at your title, and you have no claim to it. Now, if we use it, we'll pay you, but you don't have any claim to it. Right. And we sent that back, and if they didn't sign it, we returned the envelope unopened. Okay. Because we there's so many similar ideas. That's the way a lot of the phone companies. Right. Yeah, and it right. just, there's, you know, I would never steal anybody's idea because then no one would ever talk to me. Right, right. It's, it's self defeating. Yeah. Some of that is also luckily self regulated because we have a small insular industry that, you know, if, if somebody up here or any of you had a reputation of stealing ideas, well, you're not going to go too far, right? Not a lot of people know how to work with you. And, uh, you know, I have the attorney client privilege, so right. that's a little, little bit different. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's you know, it, it's a risk. I mean, it's always about the idea. Huh? So. Uh, I'm being told we have to wrap it up now, so but thank you everybody.